today on Dr. Phil. A love triangle. She needs to make a decision, Rich or me. It's hard to make up my mind between the two. I love them both. Torn between her city husband and her country boyfriend. You had an affair and convinced him you were the victim. I didn't do it on he, purpose. No, come on. Now. Richard and Lloyd have never spoken face to face. The two men meet for the first time. Julie, you sit wherever you feel like you should. Will she choose her childhood crush? After 20 years, you wound up in a pickup truck having sex, and you initiated it. Or her husband. What gives you the right to be with this man's wife? Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. I'll try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. this couple, Julie and Lloyd. They've been in a relationship for a year and a half, but they've known each other since childhood. They both say the attraction was instant. Julie says Lloyd makes her forget her troubles. He's passionate and fun. She's attracted to his simple country boy way of life, and the sex is great. <laughs> Sounds like a really good relationship, right? Well, there's always a catch, isn't there? Julie's not married to Lloyd. She's married to Richard. <laughs> and she has been for 13 years. Now, after a year and a half of this twisted love triangle, they're all saying, you know what? Enough's enough, and too much is too much. And it's time to figure this out. Like the old saying goes, two's company, three's a crowd. So Julie has reached out to me desperate for me to help her decide between her husband and her childhood crush. I have been married to Rich for 13 years, but I have been having an affair with Lloyd for about a year and a half. It's hard to make up my mind between the two. I love them both. When the passion with my husband died a few years ago, we just let it die. There's no kissing anymore. I will not initiate sex, and he will not ask for it. Lloyd and I reconnected after about 25 years, and we just picked up right where we left off. <laughs> we went to a local pub and reminisced about old times. Him and I left, and we went parking in his pickup truck. And I can't say we made love, we, we just had sex, like two 16-year-old kids. The passion that I felt with Lloyd was amazing and something that I hadn't had in years. I'm happy, yeah. There are so many qualities in Rich that I don't want to let go of, but yet there's a lot of qualities that Lloyd has that keeps me going back. Really? You're lying. I just can't make up my mind if I should stay with Rich or go with Lloyd. Well, Julie may be having a hard time deciding who to choose, but Richard's pretty clear that he wants Lloyd to just get the hell out. He just wants him to get lost. When I first found out Julie was having an affair, I was extremely upset. I had told her I was packing her things and don't even bother coming home. She begged me not to leave her. We have to learn to be different. She made a point of convincing me that she was going to end the affair, that she would do whatever she had to do to make our marriage work. After we had that talk, I would find out that she had gone to see Lloyd again. I know that Julie goes to Lloyd's and stays two or three days while I'm gone. It's very upsetting. She's with another guy in his place. I did recently threaten Lloyd. He was not allowing her to use her phone or respond to me, and so I texted him directly and said, Lloyd, you give my wife her phone back or I'm coming down there to break your neck. I wonder if I'm doing the right thing by sticking with Julie and trying to make my marriage work or is it time to cut my losses and move on? You believe that, that you love your husband, Yes. right? You do yes. love your husband. Yes. But there's Lloyd. Yeah. 
I saw him after 20 some years, and it happened, and then we just um, well, kept it going. Okay, hold on a second. You said you saw him after 20 years, and it just happened. You, you, you wound up in a pickup truck having sex. I hate it when that happens, but <laughs> it just ha you just saw him and it just happened. We're grown. We know what we're doing. So it, we, didn't it didn't just, just happen. happen. No. In fact, you got in the truck with him and you initiated it. Yeah, yes, I okay, did. Okay, so it didn't just happen. Right. You're the it. You, you happened. Right. Did you know that? I did not know that. Because I know Lloyd's easy to paint horns on here, but she's a little horny herself. Apparently. You, you watched the tape at the top of the show, right? Yes. Was that the first time you've actually seen them together? Yes. And they were, but you see it now, they're... Pretty chummy. Tell me how you wrap your head around that. What does that mean to you? Betrayal. He uses emotional blackmail and guilt to, to keep her on a string. So she's a victim in this, in a sense. I believe that she is, yeah, at this point, because she has told me many times. And I believe her when she looks me in the eye and tells me it's over, it's over. Well, yeah, because she knows she's honest. She has been for 12 years. Had no reason to ever doubt anything that she did. But you think she's a victim here? So you I feel believe, sorry for her in I a do. sense. When you sat down and told him about this, did you portray yourself as a victim? I didn't think I did. Because well, well, I wait said, a minute. You didn't actually sit down and tell me about it, though, did you? I, I wrote him a letter. You, on Facebook, didn't you? Basically texting. Here's what you said. Things have gotten way out of control with that friend of mine, Lloyd. Our talk time has become way too much. I don't know how to fix things because I just can't stop talking to him. I don't know why I allowed this to happen, maybe because of all the resentment I have towards everyone. Maybe I'm just lonely. Maybe I am just a person. Please don't leave me. This is all on me. You are the perfect husband and father. I am done talking to him. I want and need you. I just knew I wouldn't stop talking to him unless I told you. I couldn't give us 100% until I told you. I mean, it just goes on. But, I mean, now that was... 15 months ago, you said you were done talking to him, but you it wasn't a talking. It was more than talking. But you didn't quit. No. How did you convince him you were a victim? I didn't. I didn't. No, you did. You did. You convinced him you were a victim. And while he was saying you were a victim, I looked over and you were sitting there like you were poor pitiful pearl. How did you pull that off? I'm just saying that it's... It, I don't know. I don't know. No, that's amazing. You went off and had an affair with a guy and convinced him you were the victim. How did you do that? I didn't. Yes, you did. I didn't do it on he, purpose. He's, no, come on. I didn't on. do it on purpose. Come on. I told him for, for the whole entire time, this was on me. Did you convince yourself you were the victim? I never thought I was a victim, but maybe, I, maybe you're right. I well, don't know. Well, how did you sell it over here, though? I don't know. It didn't take much selling, Dr. Phil. I've been Julie's biggest protector and defender for 15 years. We make a great team when we work together. You've got a new team member now. We're going to meet them after the break. Uh, Richard and Lloyd have never spoken face to face. I'm going to help them through this awkward introduction when we come back. Julie and I were pretty awesome in bed. We we're both in love with each other. She needs to make a decision. It's either Rich or me. And later... My grandson knows something is going on because when Rich goes to work, he whispers in my ear and says, are we going to go see Lloyd? Julie says she has a big dilemma. She loves her husband, Richard, of 13 years, but she is also in love with her boyfriend, Lloyd, and has been carrying on an affair with him for about a year and a half. Now, Lloyd says 
He's loved Julie ever since they were kids. He let her go once, and he says he will not make that mistake again. Take a look. <laughs> I told Julie that I was madly in love with her, that I would never let her go. She really makes me happy. I love taking her out. I want everybody to see that I'm with Julie. We're both in love with each other, and we don't want to lose each other. I always enjoy seeing you. You know that. Her husband would be gone. She would come to stay with me, or I would go up there for a couple of days. I get mad when Julie goes back on Sundays to be with her husband. Julie and I, we're pretty awesome in bed. I make Julie happier than Rich does, but she feels more secure when she's with Rich. She needs to make a decision. It's either Rich or me. We'll never let her go, no matter what she decides to do. OK, uh, Lloyd is going to join us now. This is the first time these two gentlemen have spoken to each other in person. So um, Lloyd, come on out. I'm going to put him here. I'll have you stand, if you would. Just step down here. Lloyd, how are you, sir? Good. Julie, you know. Uh, I'm Dr. Phil. Nice to meet you. I'll uh, have you sit right over here, if, if you would, Lloyd. OK. And uh, Julie, you sit wherever you feel like you should. <clears throat> I'll let you make up your mind on that. Um, you are in a year and a half relationship with Julie? Yes, sir. Um, now, at the time you got into this relationship with her, you were married yes, for sir. 20 years? 22 years. 22 years with children? Right. Okay. So if you have your way about it, you will bust up this relationship, and she has busted up your relationship. Right. Because you've, after 22 years, right. you, walked away. You, you walked away. What gives you the right to be involved with this man's wife? It doesn't. I mean, it's wrong. It's completely wrong. But take me through the moment when you gave yourself permission to get involved with this man's wife. When Julie made the move is when it started. Uh -huh. So he says that you are manipulative and guilt-inducing. You take her phone from her where she can't get messages from him or call him, that you've said to her, Look, I left my family for you. I quit drinking for you. I've changed my whole life for you. You can't leave me now. Do you say that to her? Yeah, I do. What do you want to say to him? I don't know if I can. <laughs> I've texted Lloyd a few times. He knows how I feel. And Well, I don't know how you feel. I'm I very got upset with him. Would, you, very would you yell fire it. if you were on fire? It's not my way, no. I, I'm... How do you feel about them over here holding hands? You, you don't like her going back to him. No, I don't like it. But... I think the thing that I, you know, I told Lloyd one time in a text that was said in kind of an angry period of time, obviously, but, you know, they're having fun and games. We can see what they're doing up there. But it's a weekend getaway. They don't have reality. And... They got this little junior high romance type thing going on that makes them both feel real good because they don't have any responsibilities when they're together. If they were together, and I've told Julie, you know, maybe a separation is what we need, and maybe you need to just go live with Lloyd for over three or four months and see how it works out for you when reality sets in. So you want me to help you pick? I don't want you to help me pick. What, what, what do you want? I just, I don't know. what. I need to get this on straight. Ask me a question. You ask me anything you want to ask me if you are prepared to hear the truth. I'm prepared to hear the truth. Then ask me a question. I don't know how I got to this point. I don't know why I let, I, I put myself in this, in this situation. Nobody did it. I did it. Okay, so if I can paraphrase, your first question is not what to do. Your first question is, how the hell did I get in this situation? Yes. Right? Okay. I, I, I'll answer that. We have to take a break, and then I'm going to answer that question right after the break. Now, why are both of these men 
leaving everything up to Julie. I, I'll start unraveling this after the break. You were taking your child to hang out with your lover while his dad was on the road working. And later... You know, I gotta leave you. I can't do this. I need to walk away. And you know that was wrong. And I told you that was wrong. Bringing my grandson around Lloyd at first seemed okay because he didn't get to see anything other than friendship. Our grandson would come home and make little comments. Hey, me and Lloyd are country boys. Dad, you're a city boy. Very hurtful. My grandson knows something is going on because when Rich goes to work, he whispers in my ear and says, are we going to go see Lloyd? I feel extremely guilty because I know better than to introduce my grandson into something like this. Your grandson, are you raising him? Yes. So this is essentially a child. Our child. Right. So you were taking your child mm -hmm. to hang out with your lover. Yes. While his dad was He's on the working. road working. Yes. Really? Yeah. Did you comment on that? Yes. I told her I was not happy with that, with, with that situation, that it was going to lead to a lot of problems long term because he was gonna end up being torn. How old is he now? Five. Then when he gets six, seven, and eight, and he remembers that his mother, because you're his mother to him, you can call it grandmother, you can call it aunt, you can call it whatever you want, was taking him to hang out with another man that he sees having affection interaction, affection with, I'm not saying inappropriate, but affection with, while dad's gone, what, what is, how, how does he accommodate to that? How, how does a child sort that out in their mind? You know, I don't know. I know they couldn't possibly. You need to stop taking your child around your illicit love affair. It is inappropriate. It is inappropriate. It is, it is emotionally abusive. This is all around bad idea. You do not take your child to go see your lover. Bad idea. Bad idea. You need to stop that. Let me be real clear. You need to stop that. Okay. How did you get in this situation? You, know. you, you got in this situation because the two of you stopped working on your relationship and then you went and started playing footsie with him and you're quite right and it's it's easy when you don't have bills to pay you don't have a house to run you don't have problems to solve all you have to do is just be on a date it's easy to have fun on a date. It's easy to be charming on a date. It's easy to have fun when you're just out playing. Correct. It's very different when you're actually involved in each other's lives on a day-to-day -day meaningful basis. And it's really hard to compare falling in love with being in love. Falling in love is exciting and exhilarating and infatuation. And being in love is a more comfortable, predictable, day-to-day -day sort of thing. It's not that one is better than the other. It's just different. Right. And it's apples and oranges, and it's an unfair comparison. This, this whole thing is just so illogical. I don't even know how to wrap my mind around it. You two have arguments about this, right? You two have arguments among yourselves and about your marriage, correct? You're upset with her about her relationship with him. 
You're upset with her about her relationship with him. Correct. You're upset with yourself about your relationship with both of them. Is anybody happy? Mm -mm. No. no. Surprise! <laughs> we'll be right back. You jumped out of a moving car. Why did that seem like a good idea? We were arguing, and I just, like, I got to get out. What do you think about that? It's embarrassing. Lloyd is very possessive and jealous and wants me all to himself without Rich in the picture. It just upsets me when I know that she's going back home. Our arguments can be very volatile. One night when we were driving down the road, I had said I was going to go home to Rich, and so Lloyd jumped out of the car. Another night, he grabbed me by my arms. I didn't even realize how hard he grabbed me until I went home and saw the bruises on both sides. This past weekend, Lloyd did not want me to go home. I had my grandson in my arms, and Lloyd pushed me backwards. I did not fall down, but I lost balance. I gave her a little push, but that's all that's ever happened. Now I am scared that I might be getting myself back into a volatile relationship. You've, you've been married a couple times before, okay? And um, so I, I, I want to... I want to write something down here. Now, you have had previous partners, okay? And we said that those, those partners were not good in that they were abusive, correct? Yes. Uh, we said that those partners were not good because there was alcohol involved, correct? Yes. Uh, we said those were not good uh, because they were unpredictable, correct? Correct. Controlling? Yeah. Jealous? Yes. Possessive? Yes. Now, you're in a relationship with Lloyd. Oh. You just described marks on your arms. Um, you said you stopped drinking for her, uh, but the truth is you are drinking again, correct? Correct. So he is drinking. You said they were unpredictable. Did I hear you say he jumped out of a moving car? Yes. Because you didn't like what was going on, so you jump out of a moving car. All because he doesn't want you going back to your husband. How dare you go back to your husband? He objects to that, wants to control it because of jealousy and possessiveness. I know. Now, I'm sure he's a hell of a lot of fun in the seat of a pickup truck, but on the other hand, it seems to me that partners one and two and potential number four seem to have an awful lot in common. What do you think, Lloyd? Completely right. You jumped out of a moving car. Why was this? Why did that seem like a good idea? We were arguing, and I just, like, I got to get out. And I just got out. And you went to rehab, right? Yes. And uh, how long after rehab before you started drinking again? I was three and a half months. It's a tough disease. It's subject to relapse. It, uh, it, it takes a lot of work. And I, I hope you continue the battle. I hope you fight back on that. What do you think about that? Well, when it's written down and when it's, it's embarrassing. If she has a brain in her head, she is not going to pursue a relationship with you. I can't do this. 
I need to walk away. Julie never wears her wedding band when she's around me. Today I caught her with the wedding band on and she knew it bothered me. This finger. Oh, shoot. I don't usually wear it. And why did you have it this time? And I forgot to take it off. But then I honestly didn't know if it was appropriate to take it off. I don't know what's right. So every time I see that ring, you know it kills me. I know. If I got rid of my ring, then I'll see you with your ring. You know, marriage is tough. Do you agree marriage is a lot of work? A lot of work. You know, Every day. If I pull some statistics together about marriage, just so people know, mm -hmm. uh, first marriage, divorce rate's about 35 to 40% in America. Second marriages, it's about 60 to 65% divorce rate. Third marriages, about a 70% plus failure rate. Marriages that are born out of infidelity, particularly when both people are cheaters, about 95% failure rate. So the chance that you two are going to get married and sail off into the sunset and live happily ever after, not a good shot. You got enough of an uphill battle in the one you've got. I'm just telling you the truth. I, I, know. You know, I told you, don't ask me if you don't want me to tell you the truth. He says, he's not abusive. You're drinking, fighting. Come on, who are you turning down? If this... He left his wife and kids. He's drinking, fighting, and jumping out of your truck. Who the hell did you turn down? Whether you stay with him or whether you don't. This, he's not a good fit for you. And your guilt inducer saying, I left my wife and kids for you? What, that's her fault? The thing is, I've only done it, what, once? One what? When I pushed you. And what did I do when I did that? What did I say? Time done, I am never doing, you know, I got to leave you. I can't do this. I need to walk away. And you said, no, it's more my fault than it is yours. It was wrong. And you know that was wrong. And I told you that was wrong. I know. And I've only done that that one time. I've never, ever done that to anybody. And you know that. Well, she may know it, but I don't. I don't think you're an evil guy. I think you are confused. I think you are lost. And I think you are an alcoholic. And you put an alcoholic in a high-stress, desperate situation, they are going to make bad choices at a high-risk level. You are a high-risk candidate for her statistically, behaviorally, and life match-wise. You guys have absolutely no business being together. You can kill the messenger, but I'm telling you, the chance of this thing working between the two of you is zip, zero, not it, and yet is not going to work. And I'm just telling you. And you can be upset for me telling you the truth, but the day will come when you will say, he told me the truth. I didn't want to hear it, but he told me the truth. Right. And if she has a brain in her head, she is not going to pursue a relationship with you because you are a high-risk candidate interloping into a marriage where you have no business being. Mm -hmm. Then you went from the bar to the pickup and had sex. Reckon you could at least require that she stop. Have I been clear? Yes. There is zero future here. Mm -hmm. This is doomed. Whether he, if, if he stood up right now and said, you know what, I watched that tape of you two playing footsie and kissing and hugging and all that. You know what? You deserve each other. Just go forth and multiply. Do whatever the hell you want to do. I'm going to take myself. I'm going to go down the road and I'm going to be happy to hell with you. Go on. I would tell you the same thing. The chance of you two being together long term 
is zero. That's just my opinion. It is, it is not going to work. You met, and you, you, the first time you went out together, you went to a bar. <laughs> and then you went from the bar to the pickup and drove down the road and had sex. Both of you married. And you actually met at a funeral, right? His mother's funeral. His mother's funeral. And then went to a bar and then went to the pickup and then went and had sex. Okay. You need to move on. If you are willing to forgive and try to work on this marriage, reckon you could at least require that she stop. Because that would seem to me to be a prerequisite. Yes. And then if you wanted to work on it, then, then I'm willing to help y'all do that. You have problems in this marriage. Yes. If you interact with her the way you interact with me, that's a problem. <laughs> I would think she would want a little more out of you than maybe what she's getting. Um, that doesn't justify her having an affair. Your problems generate marital issues. They don't generate extramarital issues. There's a difference. The extramarital issues you own. The marital issues you have plenty of ownership in. And if, in fact, you do care about her, You'll leave her the hell alone. Stop. Right. One last thing. We all have a personal truth. And we generate the results in life we believe we deserve. And you've generated yourself a mess. That tells me that's exactly what you believe you deserve. You got to heal that personal truth. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to help you do that. Thank you. Now, I want you to look me in the eye and give me a clear commitment about what you're going to do. I'm going to fix me, make an effort anyway. And I'm going to stop seeing Lloyd. And I want to work on my marriage. I want to get it back. He's a good man. Will you respect that? Yep. You will? Yes, I will. Okay. Coming up, what Kathy Lee and I now have in common. I'll tell you what I mean after the break. It's not often I get to turn the tables on Philip and brag shamelessly about all he has accomplished, but today is a little different. Recently, we had the privilege of being invited to New York to rub elbows with other broadcast luminaries who were being inducted into the Broadcasting and Cable Hall of Fame. I just happen to be elbow to elbow right now with one of those honorees. I wanted to share that special night with the people that mean so much to him his audience. I am so proud of Philip. Him being inducted into the Broadcasting and Cable Hall of Fame, I can barely speak without crying. It's like I get total body chills just thinking about where we are, why we're here, and yes, it's very emotional. Our dad is amazing. He works so hard to do what he does. And tonight is one of those nights where you see that everybody else agrees. He loves what he does, which is my favorite part about watching him kind of grow through his TV career. It doesn't get any better than this. He says, I always get all the credit, but it's really all the producers that do all the work, which is kind of a lie because he's a very hardworking man. In fact, he's the hardest working talent 
that I've that I've ever worked for. He's a talented man, but he's also brilliant. This is really an honor for the show itself. It's a celebration of everything that we have accomplished as a television show. He's a great guy, he really is. And I'm glad he's getting his thing tonight. Regis is already in. He was wondering what was taking so long for Dr. Phil. I mean, you know. Yeah, it's about time they, they paid a little attention to Dr. Phil. I knew from my encounter with him that he'd be really good on television, and he turned out to be better than I thought. Not just good television, great television. I am proud of what we were able to create together. I am proud of what you continue to manifest in your daily work, in your shows out into the world, and I am proud of you being inducted into the Broadcasting and Cable Hall of Fame. Who knew? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Phil McGraw. It really has been an interesting ride for a guy that had absolutely no intention of ever being on television, ever. You know, an interesting thing about our show, we're in our 14th season now. Carla Pennington is our executive producer. She's the only one I've ever had or will have. Even across 14 years, hell, I've got the same seven cameramen I started with day one. But the most important people to thank, like so many of, of y'all have said before me, are my family, Robin, Jay, and Jordan. We started with a mission and we said on our show we want to deal with the silent epidemics. We want to give a voice to those people that don't have one. We want to change the narrative in America about mental health and mental illness. And I think we've done that at least in a small way. We've contributed to it. To be up here and inducted into the Hall of Fame is really pretty surreal for an old country boy. And uh, I just thank you. Thank you very much. When somebody puts you in the Hall of Fame, that means something. It just kind of is a way of reminding you that people appreciate what you're doing and take it seriously, which is good. quite a night, wasn't it? It was fun. It was so beautiful and so well-deserved. Yeah, so well-deserved. Well and he made the cover. Love. Love that he made the cover. Well, I really am proud of all we have accomplished on this show so far, and we're really not done yet. In fact, the public probably doesn't know it. It's been in the industry. But we just announced uh, that we're going to continue the Dr. Phil show and we have been renewed until the year 2020. Uh, that's just the beginning. So um, thanks for um, bringing all that up and thank all of you for all of your support over all of these years. I want to thank all of my guests today. For more information about today's show, go to drphil.com. We'll see you next time. Today on Dr. Phil. My dad sent him money to a woman in Mexico that he had an affair with. He steals from family, friends, and strangers. Nearly two million dollars. She had to have a lung transplant. You paid for the lung. So she just showed up to a clinic with a lung and an igloo cooler and said, I'm here to get a transplant. She's had brain cancer five times. Seven times. Do you think maybe she's lied to you? Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. I'll try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. Five, four. I am not giving up on you.
Well, death threats from Mexican businessmen, black market organs for sale, tens of thousands of dollars in extortion money paid, and more than a hundred trips back and forth to Mexico. It's an unbelievable story that has this sweet-looking grandpa trapped in what his daughters believe is an outrageous international scam. So who's the alleged mastermind behind this multi-million dollar mystery? Well, according to Maurice's daughters, it's his former Mexican mistress. Take a look. My dad sent any money to a woman in Mexico that he had an affair with. He has sent her over a million and a half dollars. My dad is obsessed with Josefina. An extreme obsession. He met her at a hotel that he was staying at. She was the maid there. It just blows my mind. I have never met her. I have never spoken with her. My dad said that because he only had sex with her twice, it is not an affair. We believe Josefina is conning our dad, absolutely. Josefina has told my father many times that she's dying. I believe Josefina is truly sick. She may not live. It's a matter of life and death. So she started by asking my dad for money for a lung transplant. Then the lung apparently didn't take. Then she stored that lung to then resell it to someone else. That's totally black market. So clearly, she's a criminal. The lung story is preposterous. We have told my father how it's not even medically possible. Then she traded that lung to get ownership of a ranch. She's told my dad that she's eventually going to sell and then pay him back. She promised a huge payout. There's no doubt in my mind that she's telling me the truth. This whole situation, it's just shocking and bizarre. My dad believes that he is saving Josephina's life. My dad hasn't seen her for at least 13 years. My dad hasn't even spoken to a doctor or seen her medical bills. She hooked him somehow. I think she is holding something over him. I look at her as the scum of the earth. This awful woman that just is mocking my father. I want of Josefina out of his life. She's ruined his life. She's ruined our lives. This woman has torn our family apart. Well, but now, Maurice's daughters insist their father has gone from being conned to being a con man himself. They say he's lying, stealing, and taking money from innocent people to give to this former lover. My father has preyed on a lot of innocent people. His whole life is consumed by getting this woman money. My dad would tell them that he needed the money to help this dying woman in Mexico. He just finds those perfect victims. My father is a manipulator. He's a thief. My dad is financially ruined so many people's lives. Destroyed some marriages, torn families apart. I talked to a man. My dad owed $20,000 too. He'd taken out a personal loan. And his wife has Alzheimer's. He said that he doesn't have money to pay for her medical care. There was one family from church that gave my dad their entire life saving. Someone from my sister's church confronted her and said, if I met your dad in a back alley, I can't promise what would happen to him. And at least 10 people had confessed to him that they had given him money as well. He's violated such an intimate trust there. I feel terrible when I hear the stories. I wish I had the money to pay these people back. I don't want him to hurt one more person. Well, this is a hell of a mess, right? Yeah, yeah well, it gets worse. Because oh. this dad has seven children, and they claim that he has also victimized them. My dad doesn't just prey on innocent people. He has preyed upon his own family. He took money from me and each of my sisters. One of my sisters gave my dad $40,000. He called her and said that literally if that money was not wired to him immediately, that he would be killed. He has gone to a few of my sisters telling them I'll be arrested or some men in Mexico are going to come after me. I had a business with my sister and my dad. My dad was able to steal $200,000. Because my name was on the business and my sister's name was on the business, we went down with him. He's destroyed their credit. They lost their homes. They lost their cars. I went into a deep dark depression. <laughs> it's a place you kind of never want to go. At the time, it was heartbreaking. It was the greatest betrayal. Now my mom is packing up her home because my parents' house is in foreclosure. <laughs> my dad has broken our family. My dad has no shame. He literally does not care about any of us. Uh, 
okay. You were in business together. Yeah, I probably suffered the most financially, yeah. Just bottom line, how much do you think he stole from you just well, straight up? that I know of is about 200000 You know, we lost a house, lost a car. Take me through the moment that you realized my father has stolen my money and given it to some woman in Mexico to the point that I am losing my home. That's the moment I want yeah, to Yeah, I mean, what, I what like rage and anger and how could you possibly do this and think it was okay? But the thing is, you can't, there was no reasoning. And you've not spoken to him in two years. Right. People were coming to us saying he owed them money. We didn't know what it was about. And we knew there was just more to the story. And so we um, kind of stormed into his house and told him it's time to come clean. He came clean about some of it as much as he was willing to um, and told us about, you know, this woman, this money that he'd given to her. That was the point when I said, you know what, this is it. That was two years ago, and that was the last time I spoke to my father. Karina, you had his phone for a few days. Mm -hmm. What happened when you had his phone? All day long, there's phone calls, text messages, asking where his money, where's my money, where's my money. Which one of you got the death threat against your father for 40,000 bucks? She's not here. She's not here. Oh. And he actually called her and told her that he, like, she didn't personally get the death threat, but he that called her and story. told her. Then he'll have this fear in his eyes. Yeah, like, and you just, if I don't get this money, something bad is going to happen to me, you know? Yeah. And you don't want to fall for it, but you don't want your dad to be killed. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, he pulls out all the stops. By the way, he's married to your mother. Right. And she's now losing her house. Right. Because he's giving money to this woman. Right. Next, 19 years of secrets, two Mexican mistresses, and nearly $2 million just oh. handed away. Why did Maurice's wife continue to turn a blind eye to her husband's secret life south of the border? Well, I'm going to ask her. She's here. We're going to add her to the conversation after the break. He has become a pathological liar. He is dishonest to the very core. The day that I found out that my husband Maurice had an affair with this woman, my whole world was turned upside down. She has conned him. How anybody can be at death's door for 13 years, she is such a medical miracle. And later, you believe this woman just showed up at a clinic with a lung in an igloo cooler or something and said, I need a lung transplant, and I got the lung. That's basically what happened. I think my mom looked the other way for many years as far as my dad's behavior. My mother is enabling him by turning a blind eye. My mom tends to bury her head in the sand and pretend that nothing bad is happening. We had an intervention a couple years ago and told my mom, if you don't leave him, then we will walk away from you for a while. I honestly don't know why she has stayed. Well, secret phone calls in Spanish and hundreds of trips over the border. Maurice's double life has his seven daughters convinced that a bizarre scam concocted by his former mistress has turned their father into a con man and their mother into his protector and enabler. Now, before we speak with the matriarch of this beautiful family, let's hear what she has to say about her partner of nearly 50 years. My husband, Maurice, has torn apart my family. My children have just been absolutely devastated. He has used them over and over. My daughters all feel like they've lost their father. Their hearts have been broken. He has become a pathological liar. He is dishonest to the very core of his being. That's really hard and sad for me to say that. My utilities have been turned off. My internet gets turned off. Frequently, my phone gets turned off. The day that I found out that he had an affair with this woman, my whole world was turned upside down and inside out. I felt worthless. I felt like a failure. This is someone I trusted with my entire life. I have absolutely no doubt she has conned him. If I saw her, I probably would scratch her eyes out. How anybody can be at death's door for 13 years. She is such a medical miracle. If she's really ill, let her die.
I'm glad to meet you, and I'm really sorry for the circumstance. I, I'm just so sorry. I, I, I just I hate it for you. This has been going on for 19 years, right? You now Apparently, know. Apparently, yeah. Well, you did know that then, of course, but you mm -hmm. know it now. Yeah. How, how do you feel about this? Devastated, angry at myself, um, angry at my husband, at this woman. Along the way, he, he also had another woman, right? Yes. And that's when you found out that he has a daughter. Yes. You all have a half-sister. Yeah. Yes. In Mexico. Did you, did you know about that at all? Were you, Not until two years ago. It, you had to be shocked. Oh, yes. I was. What did you say to him when you found out he was shipping money off to this, this woman? Let's go back to the, the other woman, the one that's got the, the revolving lungs. And what did he tell you about it? She had to have a, a lung transplant. Okay, so she got a lung. Yes. And where did she get and the he lung? And paid for it. I'm assuming... She, he bought the, her a lung. ...on the black market, I'm assuming. It, it didn't take. So they took it out, and they put in another lung. Okay. But they kept the first one. Where did they keep it? In some kind of machine. In Mexico, they have the ability to keep organs alive. That's what we're told. And so <laughs> then <laughs> that lung was put into another woman... And her husband paid for it with a ranch. So it's a, like a swap meet. Yes. So we'll give you a ranch for this lung. Yes. Yeah. But it worked for the second woman. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. But now, so she has the ranch, so they need to sell the ranch to pay for the lung. Right. You know what's wrong with you people? <laughs> Seriously, you know what's wrong with you people? Absolutely nothing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with you people. The, that's, the, that's the problem. Right. You, all five of you, are normal, healthy, loving, caring, adjusted people. Your mind can't go right. to the places that sick, demented people's mind go, so it's hard to see that coming. Because your mother... You've been put out of your house because of this. You're now going to be put out of your house, right? Yes. Yeah. And what are you going to do? Um, well, I'm going to have to go find a job in a small apartment and go on with life. And kind of start over making your own yes. way. Let's take a break. Next, trading a lung for a ranch, selling organs on the black market, and being held hostage in a south of the border hospital. Maurice insists that his former mistress, Josefina, is on death's door. Apparently for a long time she's been on death's door. He says he needed all of the money he took from friends, family, and even a stranger at a gas station in order to save her life. Boy, do I have some questions for dear old dad. Well, he's here, and we're going to meet him next. We'll add him to the conversation right after the break. So she just showed up lung in hand to a clinic, said, I'm here to get a transplant, and I've got my lung with me. And later... She doesn't have money, so she's not actually in a hospital room. Well, she doesn't need it. She right. I know, I'm just saying, they she's on, like, the back looking. patio. Is that outdoors? Yeah, that's outdoors. She's just sleeping next to the hospital. Nearly $2 million gone and multiple families desperate for answers and their hard-earned money back. Where did all the money go? Now, to my guest, Maurice's former mistress in Mexico, who his family believes is conning their dad into believing that she is dying, and her only hope of survival is him paying for the life-saving medical care she needs. Now, Maurice disagrees and insists that she is sick and he will get his money back. Take a look. I met Josefina nearly 18 years ago in Mexico. I had a three-month affair with her. 
I'd already had an affair with another woman. I didn't think it was a big deal. Three or four months after I came back to the United States, she told me that she had lung cancer. She said she needed a transplant. That's how it all started. I've been sending her money to keep her alive. I haven't seen her in 13 years. She promised that she would return all my money. I, I, uh, I borrowed my money from, from my children. I said I was going to pay them back with interest. I did steal $200,000 from my daughter, the line. Josefina needs $675 to get out of the clinic. If she could just get out, she would reimburse everybody. It'd be foolish to stop now. Now, before we add Maurice to the conversation, I wanted to ask all of you at home on Twitter if you believe Maurice is being taken advantage of, tweet hashtag Dr. Phil yes or hashtag Dr. Phil no. And if you want to join today's conversation, just tweet hashtag Dr. Phil, hashtag money to mistress, and you can join this conversation. So Maurice, come on out. <clears throat> Maurice, Dr. Phil. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you, sir. Have a seat, if you would. Thank you. Uh, Maurice, I'll just jump right into it. I, I've been here talking with four of your beautiful daughters and your wife, Linda. Mm -hmm. They feel lied to. They feel betrayed that you have stolen money from them to the point that she's lost her home. She's losing her home. Do you deny that, or is that true? I think that happened. I want to see if I understand the timeline of, of this right. So in 1996, mm -hmm. Maurice and Josefina meet, and you begin a three-month affair in Mexico. And in 2000, Josefina calls Maurice and says she has lung cancer and needs a transplant. Mm -hmm. Why call you four years later and say, I, I need a lung transplant? Well, because she didn't have anybody to, uh, to go to. Where'd you get the lung? She went down to Veracruz to, to receive that lung and... and uh, On the black market? Yes. So you, you paid for acquiring the lung. Mm -hmm. So she just showed up lung in hand mm -hmm. to a clinic, said, I'm here to get a transplant and I've got my lung with me. Yeah. That's basically what happened. You believe this woman just showed up at a clinic with a lung in an igloo cooler or something and said, I need a lung transplant, and I got the lung, and this clinic just had a transplant team just happened to be standing by in Mazatlan? No, well, the doctor was the one that uh, put the whole thing together. Shockingly, it didn't take. Uh, so, Josefina decides to store the lung. She stored it for about two weeks. Like at the house? No, no, not at the house. Where'd she store it? At the clinic right there, and that's okay. what happened. And then she finds another lung, and you help her pay for the second lung and transplant. Mm -hmm. So, she says, okay, now I got an extra lung. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, she sells it. Right. So, they, that's when they swap the ranch. Yeah. So don't have the cash, yeah. but I've got a ranch I'll trade you for the ranch worth a million dollars. That's right. But despite the new lungs, she's too sick to sell the ranch. Well, she was too sick to do, do right immediately, yeah. She's yeah. also mm -hmm. had brain cancer? Yes. Five times? Seven times. Seven times. <laughs> Seven brain cancers. She survived that. And then in 2002, the lung recipient died. Mm-hmm. She, she gave it back to her. Josefina sells a lung on the black market for 2.7 million bucks? 2.2. 2.2 million bucks. But she says she can't pay you back. She got the money, and the money went into a bank, and it's, it's there, frozen. Be Why is it frozen? Because of the amount of money. It's too much money. I, I didn't know you could have too much money. <laughs> she has too much money. You have a computer, right? Yeah. Do you ever check on these sort of things? Yeah. Because just before I walked over this morning, I just thought, you know what? I think I'll just Google up and see what a lung costs on a black market. And what'd you find? In China, you can get one for an average of about $23,000. Mm -hmm. In Europe, it was even less. 
in Mexico, they didn't really have much of a selection. Uh, yeah, I know. I even looked on eBay. Uh, <laughs> and they just didn't have anything. Uh, Mauricio's family says he doesn't even remember the names of people they claim he's victimized. Well, but I have a list, and we're going to see uh, what his thoughts and feelings are about this. We'll be right back. This wasn't the only relationship you had in Mexico, right? No. Oh. Do you have a second family? It was a miserable time in our family. It hurt. It wasn't fun to realize that. Embarrassed, mad, just disappointed. When we found out that my mom knew, it felt like an enormous betrayal. This wasn't the only relationship you had in Mexico, right? No. Do you have a second family in well, Mexico? I've got one in Ensenada. Mm -hmm. a, a daughter? 19-year-old. And did you raise her? No. Have you been supporting her? Yeah. So you've been paying money there and to Josefina? Yeah. I decided that two weeks ago I was going to cut it off completely and uh, not, not have any contact with her. That's, yeah. I mean, that's not, so it's, it's, that's not entirely true. We I mean, took his phone we took away. his phone so he couldn't call her. Yeah. And he actually left <clears> my house twice trying to go call her, like walk to a gas station. I went to the bank to get the money that, that had come in. That was and what were you going situation. to do with that money? Well, I was going to give it to my wife. No, that's no, not true you at all. Weren't. No, you that's said. not true at all. I had to have yeah. him hand it over to me so I could count it. And he was not going to give any of it to my mother. Look, if we have any hope here, one thing we got to do is be just completely honest. I mean, at this point, what the hell? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got a second family in Mexico. You shipped nearly $2 million to Josefina. Wasn't your theory that they weren't going to let her out of the hospital if she didn't pay him some money? Yeah. You know what she told you? Yeah. So in Mexico, you don't pay, you don't go. That's right. So they keep you there. That's right. They keep you there. Three. So you needed to give her money so she could get out. That's, that's what happened. You do know that Mexico has universal health care, right? So she's got you and the government paying for her to go to the hospital. Well, and she's not even actually going to have a room. Pardon me? She doesn't, she doesn't check in because she doesn't have money. So she's not actually in a hospital room. Well, she doesn't need it. She, she right. can get I know, I'm just saying, they she's on like the back healthcare. patio. This is the story. This Pardon is me? the story. She's like not even in an actual room, so we can't call her to find out what room number she's in. She's out in a separate area of people who can't pay. Oh. I mean, even this is how ridiculous it is. But, but he, he just he makes can't up reason with no. him. I mean, you it's, can't reason with She's in a patio room? Yes, literally. <laughs> is that? No, she's behind behind the, the clinic. Is that outdoors? Yeah, that's outdoors. In a patio. So a patio. And she's it's... cold and she has no sweater or shoes because she's so poor. So she's at a hospital. Not in the hospital. But not in the hospital. She's just sleeping next to the hospital. Well, yeah, because the back end is, is, is enclosed. She's able to stay right there with the, with the hope of getting the, the money. And he believes this. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. That's like, what's what, like, so... What, are, what do you do with that? Anything she... Okay, well, this is just an example of one money transfer service that Maurice has used to pay for this kind of explanation. It's sent anywhere between $150 and $990 nearly every day for the entire year. The money transfers from just this company totaled a hundred and five thousand one hundred and thirty-four dollars and one cents. That's just from one company. Right. So where does he get all of this money? Well, I made a chart. This is just according to Maurice, and I'm not even sure he knows for sure. He has taken his family for $500,000. He's taken $500,000 of his own money out of his account with he and his wife. He's gotten 3500 from one guy, 2700 from another, 3000 this guy, an investor, 100000 
Mexican businessman, 40 grand, 2,700 to Greg, 20,000 to a friend, 12,000 from a church member, 40,000 from another church member, 60 from a friend, five strangers totaling 300,000, another stranger for 500 bucks, this one was the one at the gas station, I think, <laughs> church elder, undisclosed amount, six church members, uh, all of this, and when it's all added up, that totals to $1,464,400. And that's just what we've been told. Right, right. There's no question that's not the bottom. Right, no. Mm -hmm. It is not in the realm of possibility. Do you believe what he's telling you? Well, I don't believe it. Joining us now is Dr. Pat Basu. He is the chief medical officer of Doctor On Demand, which is the company that Jay and I have that you've heard us talk about. Now, Dr. Basu has served as a White House fellow. Prior to that, he served as course director of health policy and economics at Stanford University. You've been listening to everything. What do you think of Josefina's claims when it comes to all of this lung manipulation? I mean, is this even remotely possible? It's not possible at all. It is, step it up is. here, because I want to be sure that he can hear you clearly sure. and concisely. You just take my chair sure. here. Sure, sure. Just uh, take, take my chair so you can speak directly uh, to Maurice, if you would. Uh, Maurice, this is Dr. Pat Basu. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so, so, is it possible what she's telling him is true? There is no way this story is possible. And I should maybe just clear something up because there's this talk about the, the black market, which does exist. But even in, in that case, it is not just a box of old organs that's lying around. <laughs> there, there, is, there is no sort of black market box where they just sit there. Whether it's legal or the black market, that transplant has to be done in this very small window or the lung itself will perish. Okay, so what is the chance that she could go to Veracruz, get this lung, bring it back up to some clinic, some doctor does the transfer, it doesn't take, so she takes it out, puts another one in, saves this one for three weeks in a cooler or something at the, at the clinic where they keep spare body parts, apparently, for three weeks and then sell it again to some, or swap it for a ranch or whatever. What's the chance of that happening three weeks later? Yeah, Maurice, I just have to, I have to tell you, the chance of that is zero. There is no single aspect of that story is possible, let alone the entire chain of events. It is just entirely not possible in, in any universe. Do you believe what he's telling you? Well, I don't believe it. You don't believe which? I don't believe what he's saying. It happens down in, uh, in Mexico and it's... Yeah, you cannot revive the lung once it is, once it is dead. It is, there is, a window of six hours, and even in that window, by the time it's getting there, the lung is literally perishing. It cannot be revived. It cannot be reused in that capacity at all. Well, I don't know how that happens. Then. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. Huh? It doesn't. It happen. doesn't happen. It does. Yeah. It doesn't I do know that the lung was was three months in a in a container. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you think because she said that, that the laws of, of physics, the laws of science, the laws of medicine are suspended because of what she said. It, it just becomes true for her, but not for anybody else. Well, I know that, that the, the lung was for three months until it was, was transferred. The lung was outside the body for three months. Mm -hmm and then put back in. It's in a container. It, they have some type of solution in Mexico. And they have, I know, doctor, yeah. I, I know. Yeah. This, this doesn't even make you think maybe she's lied to you? No. OK. All right, listen, that's very important for me to hear. I, that's very important for me to hear. It helps me, that informs me to help inform you. OK, next, there is one key person missing from this conversation. 
That's Josefina herself. I'm going to ask Maurice to give her a call after the break. Let's see if she answers from the back porch of the hospital. We'll be right back. <laughs> Now dial the international number, and I would like to ask her a few questions if you could translate for me. We've talked a lot about Josefina, Maurice's former mistress. So I think it's time to try and add her to the conversation. So we are going to call her cell phone. We're going to now dial the international number, and I would like to ask her a few questions, too, if, if, if you could translate for me. Después del tono, grabe su mensaje. Marque la tecla gato cuando termine. It was a, it was a message that said, you, you know, go through. yeah. We'll just keep trying while we um, keep talking. So you don't believe Dr. Basu. We actually hired a private investigator in Mexico uh, to learn a little bit. <laughs> to learn a little bit more about Josefina, because uh, you say she's just all alone and, and nobody to call but you. And you say you're helping her because she has no family. Well, actually, the private investigator did find her, and they found that her parents are still very much alive, that she has multiple siblings, and in fact, the phone that she talks to you on is actually billed to her sister and at the same address. I don't believe it. He was also able to uh, find information about Josefina's ranch. There's no property in her name at all. No ranches even located in that area in anybody's name. So the ranch she says that she's traded for is not in her name, is not in anybody else's name, and where she says the ranch exists, there are no ranches in that area at all, period, zip, zero, not it, and yet no ranches. Well, I don't know where you're getting your information. <laughs> because yours is so... Reliable, right, Dad? I, I mean, know. you can get on an airplane, you can go down there and find out. We got the address. We can walk you right up the front door and knock. Mm. We, we, you can go to this hospital, room 103. She is not there. She is not there. That was actually inside the hospital. It wasn't on the patio. <laughs> it was inside the hospital. Ranch. No ranch. No, she was only Doesn't in. exist. Lungs that, ex that live for more than six hours. Nowhere on the globe does that happen ever, period? Does that, these are facts. These, these are not opinions. These are not matters of, I see it one way and you see it another, tomato, tomato, potato, potato. These are facts. How many doctors do I need to line up to tell you you can't keep a lung alive for more than four to six hours? I don't know, because, uh, you know, that lung is, is uh, alive for three months. Yeah. Okay, next, where did Maurice and his family go from here? Well, I'm going to tell all of these women what I think needs to happen after the break. Before we go on earlier in the show, I asked my Twitter followers if they believe Maurice is being taken advantage of, and the results are in. 54% say yes, 46% say no. I'll tell you why I think it's 50-50, because they're focusing on him as being a perpetrator of all of you and all of these innocent people we had up here, as much as they are of him being a victim by her. I'm going to talk about you like you're not here for a minute, okay? Go ahead. Uh, and I, I mean, no disrespect, but I, I have to be candid about this. I've not evaluated your father long-term or historically. All I can tell you is where I see him now. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time doing this kind of thing back when I had a real job and was in private practice. I, part of my training was in forensic psychology where I was 
often worked as an officer of the court to make determinations of sanity, person's ability to conduct their own affairs, things of that nature. It's obvious that he has constructed a delusional system here. And when you try to crack the delusional system, the, the, the walls come up. And at that point, this person is not able to separate fantasy and reality. Okay, They're, so those lines are blurred. I think you can go to any court in the land and get a conservatorship appointed. So he cannot, <laughs> so he cannot get himself bankrupt, so he cannot get himself exploited further, so he cannot uh, conduct business and, and take other people's money. The first thing I would like to do is offer Maurice a chance to go and have himself evaluated at the Lawless PV PNP Center in Dallas to have him really looked at and see if, if there are neurological issues here, uh, if there are psychological issues here that have him caught in a loop that he just can't get out of and see if we can maybe do some things diagnostically and break that up for him. And also joining us uh, is my really good friend, uh, Miles Adcox. Uh, he is the owner and CEO of Onsite. And Onsite is the worldwide leader in intensive workshops and treatment for those that uh, suffer from emotional trauma and mental health issues. Do you agree he's delusional here? Yeah. yeah. Would you take the help that I'm offering you? to get some evaluation done and, and, and focus on yourself and get some professional help with this? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I really think it would be helpful to you. When you, you finish at on-site, I'm also gonna set Maurice up with ongoing therapy uh, after he leaves here today. You know, at Doctor On Demand, we also have an extensive network of board-certified doctor-level psychologists that can see patients uh, on the Doctor On Demand app from the comfort of your own house. You don't have to get in the car and drive to the therapist office. It's easier, it's cheaper, and in my opinion, every bit is effective. And for those of you at home that want to, you can download the Doctor On Demand app at uh, Google Play's or the App Store. Um, I want to thank all of my guests today. I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Pat Basu, uh, Dr. Lawless, and the PNB Center, uh, as well as Miles Adcock and Onsite for offering to help Maurice and the family as well. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. <laughs>